Case Western Reserve University's Great Thinker series proudly presents the Origins Science Scholars Program. These lectures are presented by the Institute for the Science of Origins, a partnership of Case Western Reserve University and the Cleveland Museum of Natural History. With the generous support of Richard Morrison and the assistance of Case Western Reserve University's College of Arts and Sciences, MediaVision, and WVIZ PBS and 90.3 WCPN IdeaStream. Welcome to the Origin Science Scholars Program, a series of talks on current research topics in origin sciences. Hello, my name is Glenn Starkman, Director of the Institute for the Science of Origins, and I am pleased to serve as your host for this series. The talk you're about to watch is entitled Tales of the Weird, Where Do Bats, Whales, and Primates Come From? Presented by Dr. Patricia Princehouse, Director of the Program in Evolutionary Biology at Case Western Reserve University. Dr. Princehouse serves as Director of Outreach for the Institute for the Science of Origins. Alan Ford asked last week that I try <laughs> to, uh, you know, draw all these things together somehow with the quantum and evolution and genetics, so I'm going to give two slides and you can make your own conclusions. You may remember Glenn saying we are quantum flotsam, right? <laughs> I think uh, Crosby, Stills, and Nash put it a little bit differently. <laughs> but it amounts to the same sort of thing, right? So where, what does quantum flotsam do when it's at home? <clears throat> well, you'll hear sometimes people uh, talking about entropy and thermodynamics and saying it's not possible for uh, stuff to come out of, of just stardust, just quantum things. Um, but these uh, issues of entropy, increasing entropy, uh, and the action of thermodynamics uh, are not in conflict at all. Uh, what you have in current thermodynamics is, yes, entropy on the whole is increasing, but it's spotty. So you have low local moments of increases in complexity. And so what does that look like? Well, some of it looks like this. Right? You get systems where you get complexity going on and interesting things happen here and there. Ultimately, you'll have entropy as far as we know. We'll ask the physicists. But, uh, and this issue of randomness, we hear that evolution is random or involves random elements. What does that mean? And how is it similar or different to quantum theory randomness? So I want to differentiate two kinds of randomness. One is ontological and one is epistemological. Ontological means that that's all there is to know about it. It's truly random. Epistemological means that we don't know uh, why you know, all the elements, we can't know all the elements that go into something. Uh, but it's not truly ontologically random. So quantum is true ontological randomness. Things like evolution, <clears throat> meteorology, flipping coins, things like this are epistemologically random. Uh, it's because we don't have knowledge of all the factors. When you flip a coin, if you knew how the wind was blowing, how much force you had, all of these things, you could predict whether it was going to come up heads or tails. Right? It's epistemologic. We just don't have the knowledge of all the factors. It's not truly random in that respect. So <clears throat> that's what I'm going to say about uh, these issues better addressed by physicists. Uh, I'm going to talk about homology, uh, whales, and apes, mon uh, monkeys, apes, and uh, other primates. <clears throat> Homology is, at least to me, and I think for most evolutionary biologists, the single most important concept in evolutionary theory. Uh, it's a concept, you, you hear natural selection, natural selection, right? You don't hear homology. It doesn't sort of roll off the tongue the way some do. Sir Richard Owen, this fellow here, uh, who, was, who preceded Darwin uh, slightly, but overlapped with him, and worked on some of the uh, fossils that came from uh, the Beagle Voyage, uh, coined the term homology in a somewhat non-evolutionary context. He said, homology is the same organ in different animals under every variety of form and function. Right? So he didn't exactly have an evolutionary view of it, but he thought that the creator had some way of replacing uh, species. 
and that homology may have something to do it. Even species might pass into one another in some manner. But he didn't have the concept of natural selection, uh, and he didn't have uh, uh, all of the local uh, causality that Darwin brought into it. <clears throat> To give an example, here we have a pterodactyl, right? We have a bat and a bird. They all have wings. All tetrapods, all land living creatures with four legs, have a basically five digit limb like we have. Our, we have the primitive condition having five. Uh, the forearms of these animals all contain roughly the same bones. Birds have lost a few. Right? And that is the homologous element. But the wings are not, and they function very differently. Right? These bones uh, are the same bones, effectively, in humans, dogs, birds, and whales. But they've taken on somewhat different forms, and they're used for different things. Uh, evolutionary biologist Mark Ridley says that the pre-Darwinian sense of homology is a similarity between species that is not functionally necessary. So in order to have a flipper that does this, you wouldn't have to have bones like that. They could be in all different shapes. Instead, you have this thing that needs to be explained of why we have similar structures in very different organs. The modern sense of homology, the post-Darwinian sense, is that Homologies are artifacts of descent with modification. It's a similarity in structure despite differences in function. Or in a more strict definition by Doug Fatuma, homology is possession by two or more species of a trait derived with or without modification from their common ancestor. So to, to work with this definition, we want to look again at these things and say, what elements are primitive, were there in the ancestor, and what are derived independently? So as we said before, the bones are homologous. <clears throat> the last common ancestor of birds, bats, and pterosaurs didn't have wings. It lived on the ground, but it had those bones. And its descendants have retained those bones, even though they use them quite differently. So the bones are homologous. Uh, similar structures inherited from their common ancestor. The wings are convergent, so the wings are different. You could even throw in here the wings of a fly or a butterfly, right? They're still wings. We call them wings. They do similar things. Um, these wings uh, have an underlying, underlying bone structure that's homologous, uh, a homology that goes deeper than the wings of a fly. Bats, as we all know, use echolocation. I think we all know. And they get these different forms in their faces that are, are really quite amazing. We don't usually look a bat in the face. But these are just a few of them. And all these little uh, crenulations and elongated ears uh, have been modified quite extensively, uh, no doubt primarily by natural selection, to collect and focus sound. <clears throat> What about the tail? I said this was about tails. It's not exactly a talk about tails. We're just going to use tails and see a few things uh, that have happened to tails throughout uh, evolutionary history as a structure that is homologous across different species. So what about this tail? See how it's, it's of one membrane with the, uh, with the wing, right? So, it's homologous with the tails of their ancestors, but it's been considerably modified if you think of a tail of a, a rodent or a shrew or these sorts of things. Um, so in a little detail, if you look at these fingers, right? Bats have that webbing through their fingers. If you look at the, the bones there, the tailbone has been modified in the same direction that the digits have been modified in to help support that structure. The toes, on the other hand, have changed rather little. They're still the sorts of toes that uh, you would see on a, a mouse-like creature, thing like that. So uh, we're going to have a little interlude here, um, aptly uh, introduced by Darwin himself. He says, what could be more curious than that the hand of man formed for grasping, that of a mole for digging, the leg of a horse, the paddle of a porpoise, and the wing of a bat should all be constructed on the same pattern and include similar bones and in the same relative positions. This is the depth of, of, of evolutionary theory right here. 
it was hard to tell from the picture. Do the birds have five digits also? Um, they have. Um, they have basically shrunk. Some of them have been elaborated, and some of them are just just little splint bones. What they used to be. You can find them there, but they're so small. It's just those those few central ones that support the wing because they use mainly the uh, the feathers for flying. Uh, and as we all know that <laughs> from eating wings and chicken and turkey, you have a lot of muscle there on the uh, uh, this part here, but then a lot of the uh, weight is borne by the wings by the feathers. I mean, we know it's evolution. We know there are environmental triggers, something that would trigger the development. I mean, it's, it's, it's such a diversion of that one elongated finger um, in the pterosaur, the four elongated fingers with the one on the bat, et cetera. It's almost as though, um, you know, somebody, you know, say the magic words. Uh, it's, it's just astounding these divergences and yet similarities. And is it just environmental? Well, um, if by environmental you mean just natural selection, it's not only natural selection. We talked uh, a couple weeks ago about genetic drift, right, and about random in the epistemological sense, random factors that influence evolution. So uh, natural selection certainly played a role in shaping these wings, right? Any little, you know, small lift that could give uh, a benefit to the organism uh, would be selected for, right? And in the case of the pterosaur, uh, it was that pinky finger that got bigger and bigger and bigger, supporting that, uh, uh, that membrane. Similarly, in the bat, you get, you get a membrane like that. In birds, you get something very different. They had a different starting place in each case. And so the kind of variation that was available was different in each case. And so the sorts of things that could happen were different, and the things that got favored ultimately were different. So what would have been the first vestige of feathers, and, and how would that first have been introduced? Right. So uh, non-avian dinosaurs, as the people at the museum like us to call them, <laughs> um, nevertheless often had feathers. Uh, it's possible that little baby Tyrannosaurus rexes had feathers to keep them warm uh, in the nest and then lost them subsequently. Um, and those feathers are derived from scales. And if you look at a chicken, some, especially some of these uh, lacy bantam, if you've ever been to the state fair and you see this, these little white ones and they almost look like, uh, uh, like, like hairs, right? And if you look down on their legs, they'll start to get bigger and bigger feathers until they turn into scales. And you know how chickens' feet are, right? They still have scales there. And there are a few uh, <clears throat> fossil remnants that retain uh, some of the original material uh, and they've discovered that the feather, um, uh, the stuff that the feathers are made of is the same keratin that the dinosaur scales are made from. There is a, some DNA that if it's, if it's switched on, the feathers are going to start to, well, to grow. Well, um, you need to get the right concatenation of switches, right? And when Mark Adams talked about uh, uh, genetics, uh, you know, there are just as many constraints on genetics as there are on any of these anatomical characteristics, right? So you may or may not get things switched on, but sometimes, like with those uh, flies that he showed that had the eyes all over them, right? You can switch things on uh, and make an eye on the, on the fly's leg it won't see because it's not hooked up to the other stuff, right? But a lot of these uh, genetic elements work much more independently than we had anticipated. Yeah, so there are even um, some sharks uh, that have uh, uh, some dental material in their skin. As I heard, it, they've co-opted that gene to, uh, for that purpose, even though they still have teeth as well. Thank you for joining us. My name is Glenn Starkman, professor of physics at Case Western Reserve University and director of the Institute for the Science of Origins. And I'm pleased to serve as your host for this lecture, Tales of the Weird, Where Do Bats, Whales, and Primates Come From? Presented by Dr. Patricia Princehouse. For more information on the Origin Science Scholars Program, 
please visit the Institute's website at www.case.edu forward slash origins. In the first part of Dr. Princehouse's lecture, she introduced the concept of homology when organisms exhibit a common structure, but being used for entirely different purposes. In the second part, we will learn about the evolution of whales and other cetaceans. Now we return to our lecture. So we're supposed to talk about whales now. <clears throat> And we'll look once more at this picture with these homologous bones in the human, the dog, the bird, and the whale flipper. And so we want to know how the whales got their tails and also their flippers. There's a creationist at the Institute for the, uh, the, the Institute for Creation Research in California named Dwayne Gish. And for years he had this slide. His was a cartoon. This isn't exactly his slide. But it was just like this. It has a cow because we thought that uh, you know, the ancestors of whales were at some point ungulates. Uh, and then it has this whale, right? And it says, well, what's this transitional form that would go in between? And so he would come out with a picture like this. <laughs> I don't think that's how it happened. <laughs> but what intermediate forms would we expect, right? We've got these flippers here. We've got this kind of a, of a special tail, a fluke, right? Well, how about these kinds of transitional forms? We have in the background here a little land living creature. Here, one that, whose legs are a little bit shorter there, a little longer there, and then this one here with this elongated muzzle and these very long flipper-like things, but that still has legs behind. Um, once uh, Phil Gingrich at, the, at uh, Michigan University started finding these sorts of transitional uh, intermediates, suddenly the creationists did not want to talk about whales anymore. Whales were boring. No one would want to talk about them. So they went on to something else. Right? The, Early whale relatives, whether you want to call them whales yet or not, went through an evolutionary radiation in the Eocene period, so not so long ago compared to some of the things we've been talking about, uh, you know, 50 to 40 million years ago, roughly. Uh, and it included, it was a huge radiation. It wasn't like we were trying to get whales out the other end. It just was uh, uh, a lot of uh, an opportunity for uh, this form to take over a number of different niches. And I don't have uh, time to show you all of these different animals that, uh, that they've discovered. Some of them are more like seals. Some of them are more like hippos. Uh, really interesting stuff. I will show you the ones that go in the direction of the current whales. But don't be tricked into thinking that it, that, that was sort of the intended consequence of this. Um, and it went from, uh, from a land living animal to a fully aquatic whale-like critter uh, over the period of about 10 million years, not a very long time. The earliest whale ancestor that's been uh, unambiguously identified is this Pachycetus. Here's a reconstruction. Uh, it's a little animal that uh, may be uh, like a small wolf size that uh, lived on land. And Phil Gingrich says that if he'd just found you know, some of these bones but not this part here, around the ear, he'd have thought it was just any other kind of little uh, animal like that, of which there were many that lived at the edge of a swamp. But he says, because we have this part here by the ear, we know that it's related to whales, because it has a derived condition that has to do with going underwater and spending time in the water. Right? And so there's the start. And he found this. And he called it, uh, he and his students, Pachycetus. It was found in Pakistan. Cetus is whale. So uh, uh, he knew it was involved in whale evolution. Uh, I was in the field with him in the uh, uh, late 80s, early 90s. And uh, he was just starting to have some of this stuff come out. So I actually got to see the uh, original of this, which was very exciting. You'll notice, they have it here running, right? When mammals run, they have this curve in their spine, right? Like a dog is running or a cheetah, you see that kind of a curve, right? Now, fish swim side to side, right? When you see a shark, it's coming along like this. But whales swim like this, just like land animals running. And that's an important thing to bear in mind. They didn't have the kind of variation that would affect a, a tail that goes back and forth. I don't know if it would have been better or not, but they didn't have it, so it didn't go that way. 
Uh, here's another reconstruction of uh, Pachycetus. He's looking kind of fierce here compared to the last one. And these are some relatives that live entirely on land. Uh, and notice the tail again, right? Uh, it's the same sort of tail, same sort of carriage, uh, tail carriage. There wasn't anything special about this early whale's tail. <coughs> Here we have a slightly later form, not a whole lot later, and it is much more aquatic, right? And you can see it's still got legs in the back. It's still got a pretty similar tail to those uh, ancestors, although it's a little thicker, right? Uh, but look how much the uh, forelimbs have lengthened, uh, you know, just from the uh, wrist down. Yeah, this part is getting shorter. This part is getting longer. These same thing here. They're getting more spread out, right? The head is getting a bit bigger, longer in proportion. The neck is getting a bit smaller. Here's another one from uh, roughly that same time period, a little bit later. Right. This one is uh, adapted to a slightly different environment. The uh, front legs are not as uh, big as in the last one, but look at what that uh, flipper is doing in the rear. This is probably one that used the feet quite a lot uh, in getting around. And this one, who you wouldn't want to meet on a dark night, uh, look at these flippers back here. This is a real interesting animal. And it had a blowhole. Uh, it was, it was, it's kind of a different take on being a whale. This is an animal that it, it functions very like, uh, ecologically functions very like a whale, like we know today, but had a somewhat different way of getting around. And you can see that tail, it's still that sort of thick thing, but not like a modern whale's tail. <clears throat> at 40 million years ago, so we started at uh, 55 with the earliest Pachycetus there, we get this basilosaur. These were enormous animals. They were entirely aquatic, and they had fully fluked tails. It's small, but you can see the end of it. It's the same sort of tail that that last one had, right? Whoopsie. There we go. It's the same sort of tail here, we see there, but the end has been elaborated into a small fluke. The front part is still very primitive looking. The end part is really quite like a modern whale's tail, and it still has hind legs. They're quite small. They're sort of on their way out. But like we talked about the first time, uh, just because something isn't being used for its original purpose doesn't mean it's instantly going to go away. It's part of the whole developmental program of that organism. And so it sticks around until there's some reason for it to leave, basically. And you will still find whale, um, whale embryos have little legs. And sometimes you will find uh, you know, what are sometimes called freaks, but developmental anomalies, where they don't entirely lose that leg. And they'll have little pelvises and things. Uh. <clears throat> And there's the modern whale tail. You can see the, the fluke is enlarged quite a bit compared to that. But it is still very much the same, the same fluke. What would you attribute to the, uh, the large change in the size of the animal uh, as it adapted, as, as it evolved? Um, I am not an expert on whale evolution, <laughs> so let me say. Um, as I, well, first of all, not all of them got large, right? We have pretty small porpoises, uh, uh, river porpoises, uh, common dolphin bottleneck ones. But some of the very big ones, uh, they need the blubber to go very deep down. There are uh, food sources that they can, uh, uh, can uh, use underneath that aren't being used. Uh, a whole lot of different things that they can do for it, but I, I couldn't say, I couldn't offer an opinion on exactly why you get such enormous size. It's all cartilaginous tissue in the fluke. It's not, no bones. Uh, on what basis do you say that this whale had a, a fluke at the end of its tail and the other one didn't? Um, and, and also I wanted to ask you why the, uh, why you pointed out Again, cartilaginous tissue is what we're talking about. Uh, why you thought that one had a blowhole where the other ones didn't. And in fact, um, considering that it doesn't have a melon and the eyes are pretty, 
pretty far back. I, I would call those conventional nostrils rather than a blowhole. Uh, the, the high point on, on that picture, if, if not the animal, seems to be behind the brain. Uh, and I don't think you'd put a blowhole there. Uh, you certainly wouldn't want it to have to go through or behind the brain. So I'm wondering what the fossil basis of uh, those depictions are. So uh, the cartilaginous tail, well, we have fossils of sharks as well that are entirely cartilaginous. Uh, depending on the sedimentary environment that it's found in, uh, it can be preserved pretty well. We have skin and scales preserved from dinosaurs. Um, there are a lot of uh, these sorts of elements that, are, uh, uh, that can be preferred, pr preserved. From anoxic sediments, um, was there some unique thing like the Cleveland shell that resulted yes. in these? Yeah. We have hundreds of basilosaurs. Uh, in a uh, place called the Valley of the Whales in the Fayum Desert in, in uh, Egypt. And there are many, many of them, and uh, I have not been there again, but uh, uh, they have a lot of comparative material. That's why I put the, uh, just a, whoops, a picture there. Um, this is some of the material you find really quite complete skeletons. The animal prior to Bacillosaurus is, um, looks, remarkably like an alligator, and is there, <laughs> is there a, a, a point of divergence between, but an alligator is a, a reptile, is it? Yeah, yeah. And, as opposed to all of these, which are mammals. Yeah. So can, can, can both species be traced to a common ancestor? They have not shared a common ancestor, uh, you know, since the synapsid reptiles at the end of the, uh, well, even before the end of the Permian. So it's certainly not a homologous feature, but something that you expect is good for eating the sorts of things that both alligators and this critter ate, presumably fish, a lot of fish. Uh, and there may be other elements that enter into it. You know, there may have been other things that they did with their mouth besides just eat fish. Right? In fact, we know there surely were. Um, so it's, it's convergence. You'll find a lot of similar shapes. Uh, when we used to think that evolution could, you know, natural selection could produce almost anything. Um, uh, you know, we've slowly had to give up that view, and we see uh, again and again the same sorts of shape, shapes arising in the fossil record. And even as we look across modern animals, when we start to see things from the fossil record that we can then bring to them, we say, oh, that makes sense. But it's really, and of course also the, the uh, am amazing things that are happening in genetics and genomics, where we can see that some of these same genes are co-opted to make some similar structures. In some cases, in other cases not. You used to hear that eyes had arisen uh, 80 different times. Well, you know, maybe it's only 40, but it's a lot of times, right? And in each case, they use that Pax6 gene, but they use a whole lot of other genes as well, and the eyes are very different uh, in its convergence because it's useful to be able to use light to get around and do stuff. Most of these earlier species, it shows an elaborate neck structure. Does the mm -hmm. modern whale have that neck structure buried in that huge body? Not a lot. It's very short. Yeah. And um, Hans Thuesen, who uh, uh, is not far from here at Neo UCOM, who was a student of Gingrich, has done some terrific work on these things and the association between the, the neck and other parts of the skull. And he also has some genetic uh, uh, elements that seem to correspond to these things. Uh, and also things that affect the blood and oxygenation. There's a whole bunch of traits besides just the bony structure that are involved in making a whale. Fish have vertical tails. Whales have horizontal tails. Yes. Uh, is there a similarity in terms of the cell or how that would develop? Uh, I mean, obviously, the fish goes side by side. Whale goes up and down. But is there a developmental thing? What, what, would that be an accident that would then be beneficial? I mean, how would, they, how would you get? Is it a fluke? <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Uh, I think it's not a fluke. Uh, it is a, a, a situation in, in which, uh, you know, physically, if you're going to move through the water fast, uh, given the stuff that you have to make bodies out of, something like this or like this is the best way to go. And as long as the variation is there, they're going to build something like that. Uh, it seems to work.
Yeah, so that's why we have convergence and convergences, you know, throughout. It's because there are certain functional elements that seem to work and that we seem able to make out of things like bone and, and you know, membranes and tissues and things like that, cartilage. We hope you've been enjoying the Origin Science Scholars Program lecture, Tales of the Weird, Where Do Bats, Whales, and Primates Come From? presented by Dr. Patricia Princehouse. In our second segment, Dr. Princehouse told us about the evolution of whales. In our final segment, she will talk to us about the primates, our own taxonomical group. Now, back to the talk. All right, so <clears throat> as to primates, some hallmarks that distinguish primates. Whenever you're trying to use a list of characteristics to define a group, not every individual, is, individual species is going to have every single one, but in general, Primates, like this fellow here, are generalist arboreal mammals. Right? They have large brains compared to other mammals. Right? Even this, which is quite a bit smaller than ours, is quite a bit larger than many other mammals. We have stereoscopic color vision. Our eyes are very much in the front of our heads, even, even lemurs and lorises and things like that. So we can see, we can gauge distance. Uh, this probably has a, uh, a very strong, arose from a very strong selective factor uh, of being able to use trees to get around, to eat, things like that, to uh, sleep in so that predators on the ground don't get you. And color vision. What would the usefulness be of color vision? Well, one certainly is to identify uh, fruit that is ripe on the backdrop of green leaves. And of course, you have coevolution of the fruiting trees as well, uh, so that uh, the sorts of colors that attract primates are the sort that are selected for in the tree, because the primates eat the fruit, which has a lot of seeds, and then they run through the forest, and eventually the seeds come out the other end, and the tree is able to plant uh, its offspring around the forest. And so there's lots and lots of these uh, uh, interactions among species. Darwin said, imagine a tangled bank and all the interactions uh, among the, uh, the different plant and animal species there. So stereoscopic color vision, flat nails on fingers and toes is uh, very much a primate characteristic. So uh, we think our fingernails are kind of special. It's the same thing on lemurs, same thing on lorises. It's a, a primate trait. A long gestational period and maternal care of very few offspring. In most cases, primates have one offspring at a time, uh, twins in the case of some of the South American monkeys. Right? Uh, huge investment. So you need to have a, uh, uh, a sort of environment that you know, is stable long enough you know, to have, I mean, some of these, uh, well, ourselves as case in point, don't reach sexual maturity until into their teens, right? Even monkeys like this, they're at least two before they're able to reproduce. That's a long time if you compare to something like uh, mice or dandelions, right? So they're what are called R-selected, we're what are called K-selected. And as I mentioned before, we have five digits, which is the primitive condition. Yeah. Then it's very useful for grasping, and primates tend to have opposable thumbs, uh, particularly uh, monkeys and apes, uh, on the feet as well as the hands. <coughs> Here is a phylogeny, a family tree of the major groups of primates. So we have lemurs and lorises. This is lemur cata, the uh, ring-tailed lemur, which is uh, famous now because of various Disney or, or Pixar films. Um, the tarsier, which is a, a very strange organism with the huge eyes, uh, its own branch, right? It's actually more closely related to these guys, although it was long thought that it was a kind of a, a prosimian. We have the uh, South American monkeys. This is uh, tamarin, golden lion tamarin, uh, one of the species that does have twins. And with those species that have twins, you'll see a lot of male involvement in caring for them. The male will often carry them around so the female can, can uh, eat and bring stuff back. And yeah. um, Old world monkeys. So new world monkeys and old world monkeys, uh, monkey may not be the best term to use, but that's the, the term we use colloquially, because old world monkeys are more closely related to apes than they are to new world monkeys. 
but we call them old world monkeys, so there it is. And this guy um, is similar to a rhesus monkey. It's a different macaque species, and he's eating something there uh, in very much the same way that an ape would eat stuff. Um, you can see the ear is quite similar there. So you're getting more and more like our branch, which is the apes. Now this, we had a minute ago, is a dog-faced baboon, Cynocephalus, uh, also called a yellow baboon. And they have a unique car tail carriage, or baboons in general have a unique tail carriage to get back to the tails. If you can see there, the tail goes up and then it goes down. It carries it quite high there. And you can see this thing here that's called an ischial callosity. They have these um, calluses, big thick calluses, and they sit on them. And of course the tail has to be able to get out of the way so they can sit down, and it forms a kind of a tripod. Here is a very large issue of callosities from the rear of this Hamadryas baboon, uh, and it can make kind of a tripod there. The other thing is that baboons, uh, the, the kind of social uh, uh, troops that they live in, uh, require, or, or at least find useful, uh, very prominent sexual swellings during heat to signal from a distance. These are much more terrestrial uh, primates than most, and you can see from a distance. And again, that color vision thing, it's hard to miss that, right? Okay. <laughs> so here is the issue of callosity, and there is the, the swollen uh, in heat sign. Uh, this is a New World monkey, uh, the other branch from that tamarin that we saw. Uh, this is a spider monkey, and it has done a very different thing with its tail. Right? And this is the sort of classic monkey that you think. Only New World monkeys have this. So when you see a movie and it's supposed to be in Africa and they've got an organ grinder's monkey or something, don't believe it. <laughs> so anyway, this is the spider monkey, and it, it's almost like a third, uh, a fourth uh, uh, appendage there, a fourth limb. Uh, so it, it has very strong grasping ability in that tail. Uh, and the, the underside uh, is, is, it looks like the palm of your hand practically. It's, it's uh, smooth with, well, it has ridges, but it doesn't have hair. So uh, you can see the various things that, that they can do and that this isn't so imaginative because you can see this guy here. So, so again, tails get used in different ways. They get adapted in different situations. You have these evolutionary radiations of things with tails in a particular way or another way. Um, and then we have apes. You've all heard about the three blind mice. Well, we don't think that's quite what happened to apes, but uh, we have no external tails. Chimpanzee there. You can see on here they have the sort of tailbone that we have, all of these apes. You've got the gibbon, the orangutan, the chimp and gorilla, and the human. How are they related in a little more detail? Well, the hominoids, or which is to say apes, are split into two groups, basically. You've got the hylobatids, the gibbons, and you have the it calls it hominids. There have been a lot of different changes of terminology. In this, in this diagram, it says hominids, and you have the hominins, which are humans, gorillas, and chimpanzees, and the pongins, and there's pongo. Uh, in other cases, uh, you'll have a slightly different characterization. But that's basically the, the relationships. <clears throat> so this is a gibbon. I think they're probably the cutest of apes, really. Uh, and it has the ape characteristics, somewhat exaggerated even. Brachiation. Uh, early on in their evolutionary history, apes adopted a different kind, a different way of getting around in the forest, where you, instead of the uh, spider monkey who can use his tail to hold on, <coughs> apes got elongated limbs that could grab onto a branch and hold it there and then take the other one like this. So it requires a great deal of wrist mobility and shoulder mobility. So that's why we have this ball and socket joint and we get all those uh, uh, problems playing tennis. Uh, most organisms, most mammals can't do this at all. So be careful. <clears throat> 
And this is very interesting. In apes, instead of the baboon state or the, the monkey state where it's almost like a dog, where the uh, chest is high front to back and narrow side to side, we have the opposite in, in the other apes. We're wide this way and narrow front to back. Yeah. And this, this all goes together with the brachiating and the movement uh, because with the shoulder blades on the back like that, that's what allows us to have this sort of motion. We also have uh, in the wrist, instead of the uh, end of the ulna going up and stabilizing that wrist as it would in a dog or any other sensible mammal, it's retreated here. And so we have all of this. And so we get carpal tunnel syndrome and a lot of other things. Um, so with this front to back squishing, right, and all of these things, uh, we have a more vertical body plan than monkeys. Even monkeys that are entirely arboreal are not as upright as we are, as apes are. Um, and going along with this, this reliance on the arms, in general, apes have longer arms and shorter legs. And I worked in, at a field site in uh, Kenya where we had six different species of apes living in the same area at the same time, 19 million years ago. And some of them, a lot of them were about this size. It wasn't, they weren't as elaborated, as extreme as the gibbon. But there used to be a whole lot of apes, and now we just have a few remnants. Right? It used to be, some people say, the empire of the apes, uh, and now we just have a few. <coughs> And what happens uh, with the gibbon specifically is that when it wants to get around on the ground, which is not very often, it has to hold these long arms up off the ground. And it actually walks on two legs. It's facultatively bipedal. It's not adapted for it. But uh, it's a consequence of this upright posture. And I think if we had not come from this kind of a background, uh, we would not have uh, ended up you know, having the variation that would result in obligate bipedality like we have today and like Bruce talked about extensively last, uh, last fall in this program. So there's the gibbon. <coughs> the orang, which uh, is more closely related to us, right? Uh, again, you see these long arms, short legs. Great flexibility in the shoulder, in the hip, um, all these characteristics really um, almost exaggerated primate features of the eyes right on front. And orangs have this very narrow interorbital distance. Uh, so it, it could be that uh, it's even more important uh, for them, being a larger animal, to be able to tell exactly what branch they're going to hold on to. Um, a little more closely related, we have the gorilla. Now, gorillas live uh, primarily on the ground. I do have a friend that studies gorillas uh, who has seen them up to 50, 60 feet above the ground. But that's not what we normally associate with most gorillas. Uh, and they have developed on the ground this curious kind of, uh, uh, this curious way to get around of knuckle walking, right? Um, <clears throat> you'll see orangutans sometimes, if they come to the ground, curl up their long fingers and walk on, on this part. Right, and that's pretty easy for animals to do. These ones <coughs> have taken the kind of a pose that a football player takes when he's about to hike the ball of, of this surface here, this tiny little surface of the, the phalanx, and that's what they're resting on there. You can see it in the, uh, in the toes in that picture there. That's the top of its knuckles, and it's on that surface there, and it's supporting that huge heft just on that digit. So there are a lot of secondary modifications that have gone on in the, uh, in the wrist and hand of uh, gorillas and chimpanzees who also do that. Uh, and you can see also the, uh, uh, the huge uh, crest that they have back there, that sagittal crest, that bony ridge. Uh, that all these muscles attach to there. And so they've basically come down from the trees, uh, and they spend most of their time sitting around eating things like wild celery that don't have a whole lot of nutritional value. And so they have to eat a great deal of it. And uh, evidently it works, but again, there aren't that many apes left, so it perhaps isn't going to <laughs> work out well for them ultimately. So, And there's chimps, and of course, chimps are not only more like us physically than gorillas, uh, but mentally. 
They're very curious. They do a lot of stuff together, particularly bonobos, pygmy chimps. And so here these guys are looking at some object very interested. Uh, they still are doing knuckle walking. See that? That's that knuckle down on the ground. Um, <clears throat> and they have all these other characteristics. So our friends and relatives. And then hominids or hominins, if you prefer, in the uh, classification. Lots of diversity, uh, at least a six or seven million year heritage for the hominid line, right? Uh, and developing that upright stance very early on, long before the brain uh, uh, enlarged. And uh, <clears throat> this fellow here is the so-called hobbit, uh, which um, if you're familiar with it, right, they lived in Indonesia around 17,000 years ago, possibly descended from uh, Homo erectus that was very isolated in that region, or possibly just an island sort of uh, uh, adaptation uh, from modern humans, but with a lot of really primitive looking traits. So, uh, we have around five, four million years ago, uh, a great deal of variation. We had an adaptive radiation of hominids, of two-footed uh, uh, apes, with slightly larger brains, but not a whole lot larger than chimpanzees. Uh, and only recently have we gotten uh, uh, the sort of variation that we have today, which is within the species that we think about. So um, anyway, that is the uh, <laughs> end of our tales. <laughs> This lecture is part of the Origins Science Scholars Program of the Institute for the Science of Origins, a partnership of Case Western Reserve University and the Cleveland Museum of Natural History. It has been brought to you with the generous support of Richard Morrison and the assistance of Case Western Reserve University's College of Arts and Sciences, Media Vision, and WVIZ PBS and 90.3 WCPN IdeaStream. For more information on the Origins Science Scholars Program, including a full video archive, please visit the Institute's website at www.case.edu forward slash origins.